All right. Awesome. Mark, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you for taking your time. I know you're busy uh, to uh, share your, your wealth of information with the Hey, hey Fair podcast uh, team. Um, so, you know, Mark, I, I know you, you've been in phlebology. You were one of the first innovators. Uh, matter of fact, you were the first uh, surgeon in the UK to do endovenous ablation. Um, can you tell me like what and how you, through your medical journey, what made you choose veins? Yes, thanks, Brian. It's great. And thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this. Um, yeah, veins is really interesting. I, I started life as a general surgeon. I had no medicine in my family at all. And I just basically uh, loved biology at school and um, ended up being told I thought I was pretty thick at school. I didn't think I was very clever. And I got told uh, at a careers fair that although I was like, wasn't that great, you know, my great grades were they wanted all rounders and um as I played a lot of rugby and I sort of uh, did I got into medicine went through medicine and just fell in love with the subject absolutely had a fantastic time at medical school but the funny thing is right from I remember as a first year um uh, medical student at 18 years old just asking a doctor how veins actually worked because they were telling us about valves and things and it, it was very very clear that the doctor didn't have a clue how they actually worked so I thought fine and then as I went through and I became a junior doctor and we were ripping out veins and some doctors in some hospitals said, no, you only have to tie the top and it all thromboses away. And other people saying, no, you have to strip them. I realized that they had no idea what they were doing at all. And I'm old enough to remember that the handheld Doppler sort of then came in before duplex. <laughs> and everyone thought that was revolutionary. And then we had duplex, but they sort of said, well, you only really need it for the complex veins. And I was going through all of this as a junior doctor and a junior surgeon, and I just got more and more fascinated because I, in those days, as a trainee, I was doing cancers, you know, I was doing the oncology side, I was going through the, my different sections in urology, as you do as a rotation, and then first of all, quite broad, so you're doing orthopedics as well, and then you come down into general surgery, and it's sort of breast, lower GI, upper GI. The one thing I found is vein surgery, firstly, there's an awful lot of people who've got it. Secondly, there's virtually nobody who understands it who, or who cares about it. <laughs> so there's a wide open market as such. Thirdly, it is absolutely fascinating. The more you get into it, the more you realize that there's research that needs to be done because people don't understand it. But fourthly, and what really drives me more than anything is I've never found a condition in medicine where patients and doctors expect a bad result and do nothing about it. And it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And you say to patients, oh, your veins have come back because you've had them done five times before. And they go, yeah, well, the doctor told me they would come back. And everybody just says, oh, fine. Oh, imagine that if it was, you know, anything else, you'd be in the down to the local solicitor, you'd be, you know, issuing writs, you'd be complaining. Veins is just, accept. and the more you understand it, the more you realize that, in fact, veins shouldn't come back if you treat them properly. Apart from the natural deterioration, which you know from the Framingham studies, 3% to 4.5% per year. Apart from that, anyone whose recurrence rate is higher than that is doing something wrong. And we, you know, there's, there's a, I thought it would take me six months to convince the world. And 20 years later, I'm still trying to convince my colleagues. No, I, so man, you, you, you spoke so much truth there. And uh, man, so that's, that, that is so profound. I would say, one third so one of the reasons why i left my old employer is he failed to understand the deep venous component he failed to understand the root cause for a lot of reoccurrence uh, you know and um and i was just a sonographer but i got to see it because i was seeing patients at the beginning i was seeing them through the journey i was seeing them at the end and i was just like getting frustrated i took it very personal when somebody would have failed treatment and like you would say uh so i always so i rarely go to vein conferences mark um <laughs> and and what and people ask me all the time they're like why don't you go to vein conferences and i'm like they're all besides yourself you're an innovator you think outside <laughs> the box and you push the envelope but most of the other guys just regurgitate the yeah. same information and they haven't even thought about 
yeah. why you know one of the f- funny things is like after endovenous ablation they'll go well you know like the patient for a long time people would would have treatment from the knee you know proximal calf up and um the patient would come back and they'd have a bunch of dilated varicose veins in the lower leg and the doctors would be like well you know the veins have to reroute themselves and you know give it time and it's like no and even now <laughs> <laughs> like an American insurance, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield makes us wait six weeks to see if veins shut down. Like I've never done it. Uh, we've never done an ablation of a GSV. And six, six weeks later, the anterior accessory, which was refluxing at the beginning, suddenly shuts down. Just it it never happens. Yet that's their policy. Yeah. And, and again, the, the, this is because of people's, somebody at an academic who really didn't understand veins went through this whole policy and created this, but go ahead. I'm and, sorry. And the, no, that's just, you know, what you say is absolutely right. Cause we have the same problem in the UK where the so say top vein surgeons, the ones that the government listened to are vascular surgeons who happen to do some veins. So of course, if you, block off an artery you do find another way around you do you collateralize and so that's in their brains but of course when you're stopping reflux you're actually plugging the hole you're stopping the the falling down so the blood doesn't have to find another way around you stopped it going the wrong way and it's a totally different concept and it took me years to understand that but once you do it's like you know it's like a road to damascus sort of time you start to think oh my gosh it's so obvious and you know basically (laughs) there is no I, i one of the things i always say to people is i say if they go to a doctor for veins and the doctor does their own scan and they don't work in a team with a proper vascular scientist walk out number one. Second time if you talk to a doctor you say what happens when i uh, take away or ablate a vein if he says it finds another way walk out as well because those, those are two really big things that mean your doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. Oh, I, I agree 100 now for my american audience um in the uk a vascular sonographer is a vascular scientist they they have much higher regard for their sonographers than we do in the united states they give them this fancy title um i actually joined uh, the european uh society for vascular just because i i wanted i was hoping i could get somehow get a title of vascular scientist <laughs> if i ever no it didn't happen but i donated my money to them um, but i wanted to clarify that for americans again it's a it's a registered vascular sonographer um and we're very at my clinic we're very sonographer forward um mm-hmm. if we get it wrong the doctor's going to get it wrong most times yeah. um how do you feel about that i know you have a great oh. vascular scientist that on your team you probably yeah. have a whole bunch of them i i would say that my whole career has been based totally and utterly because I've managed to work with some geniuses, and one of them is Judy Holsot, the vascular technologist or scientist that I work with. And um, I think that most doctors don't talk to the people around them. They think that they're, you know, like the, the, the only important person. And I used to go, I mean, right from the beginning, when I first met Judy, I looked over her shoulder once, saw her scanning someone, I went, I've got to work with you, because she was seeing things I'd never seen. But then one of the first conversations I had said to her, I said, you know, I said, Judy, and this was right back in 1999. I said, Judy, I said, what's really weird is when I scan patients um, who've got great saphenous vein reflux, so reflux down the, the, from the groin to the ankle, I said, sometimes I find people who aren't refluxing at the groin, but they're refluxing below that. And I said, but, you know, the, what everybody says is you, you get your the great sphere of reflux because of pressure from, the, from above, which means the top valve has to have gone first. So I said, okay, and she said, oh, we see that all the time. She said all the time. I said, well, why don't you, t- why don't you tell us? She said, oh, because you doctors never listen. And our, our, greatest, our greatest research and the things that have come out, the trollop technique, the ascending reflux, the pelvic veins, everything is because we have the same regard for our other doctors, whether they're interventional radiologists, dermatologists, venous surgeons, as we do our RVTs, our vascular scientists, our nurses. And what we do is anyone who says, hey, isn't this interesting, we listen to. 
and we go and we look at it and because of that we discover the part of the tissue you know all these different things were published is purely and simply that we listen to people who know what they're talking about and i personally don't mind what the title is as long as you're expert at your job and you, you have to be listened to and i mean <laughs> thank god i did with judy because it's, it's made my career <laughs> no that's that's awesome that is so awesome to hear um and you you know i know that you've developed um you were the first to do endovenous ablation like we talked about uh you've developed the trial up uh procedure uh for perforating veins uh, what other, I mean, I know you've worked with, you're the lead um, investigator with the new HIFU uh, yeah. ultrasound. Uh, I know today we were going to talk about pelvic congestion, but uh, I mean, for, for my audience, they may not know. I mean, what are the things you see exciting uh, that you've worked on in the past or working on in the future? And then let's talk about a little bit about the pelvic congestion, how you, your beliefs on it and uh, the deficiencies you see. So I think I think when we're talking about leg varicose veins now, um, if people keep up to date with what is going on and they're doing good endovenous ablation with the right um, uh, techniques and they're using the right powers and they also accept and understand, in, um, I know it's controversial, but the perforator veins and the pelvic reflux into the legs. As long as you understand that, I think legs now, we should be able to get everybody up to a fairly good standard. So looking forward, what are the exciting things? Well, the first most exciting thing is pelvic congestion syndrome. And pelvic congestion syndrome, we know that one in six women who have leg varicose veins and one in 30 men who have leg varicose veins have them predominantly or a major bit coming from pelvic veins and it just shocks me that doctors will um they will know that venous blood goes from your big toe to your heart and they only look for deficiencies of that circulation up to the groin so anywhere that it falls out into the veins up to the groin is varicose veins but above that oh it just doesn't happen unless of course you're a boy and if you're a boy then you can get varicose veins around your testicle because you can see it and that's got a varicose seal. But when you go to these conferences and you hear these say world experts talking about pelvic congestion, they'll tell you it's females only. And I always stand up and say, so you don't see boys with varicose seals? And they get very embarrassed and they go, as whitely talking again. And, you know, the, the basically pelvic congestion, simply, if we just called it, you know, varicose veins of the pelvis, then I think it would be a lot easier. But we have to now call it pelvic venous disorders because, you know, people want to give it a sexy title. But it really is varicose veins of the pelvis and it can come from because of the valves not working and reflux or it can come because of obstruction and you know as you all know there's a huge amount of um uh, uh, arguments as to which is more important and how we should treat it and that's an academic thing but you know it is phenomenal but the most important thing is in in the uk and we've got a much smaller population than yours but in the uk we know there's about a million women who have chronic pain in their pelvis whose lives are disturbed by it and they go to gynecologists and they get told you know we're going to look for endometriosis we're going to look for adhesions they don't they, they come out of it at the end and they say there's nothing wrong with you you have to see a psychiatrist you're mad they've paid for lots of investigations they've had invasive things like laparoscopy and nobody picked up they've got varicose veins in the pelvis causing it and you know that's shocking shocking it, so i it, it is it is so shocking and i see it all the time i've been I've been scanning pelvic and uh, iliac and pelvic veins for, for about 15 years. Um, I had a family member who I scanned uh, because they were going to go on birth control. And I have seen enough women, young women who've, who've had DVT after starting birth control. That is said, hey, let me, I want to look at your iliacs. And I did. The iliacs were beautiful, uh, but their pelvic, her pelvis was just engorged. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was a you know, 20 year old, uh, uh, relative of mine. And so I, she was going to the OBGYN like the next week. And so we wrote up the report. We said that she had pelvic congestion and I didn't want to be the, you know, it's weird whenever you're dealing with family, you don't want to be the only person. So I was yeah. looking, I just wanted a conf confirmation. So I, we requested a transvaginal ultrasound and she went and they go, you should go see a vascular doctor. We don't do this. And so I called and I'm like, listen, what do you mean you don't do this? Like, I just want you to look for 
for uh, uh, varicosities across the myometrium. I want you to look for periuterine veins. Like these are obvious. I can see them with the transdermal probe. You should have no problems. I get a report back that was normal. <gasps> yeah. And yeah. I wrote a letter to the doctor yeah. and I just yeah. blasted. I, I just <laughs> gave yeah. her all the information. And, uh, and the thing is that the doctor gave me, a, the OBGYN gave me a call back. She said, you know, you came and talked to me about a couple of years and, and I want to apologize and this and that. And it mm -hmm. turns out her sonographer, the, the OBGYN sonographer ended up coming and becoming a patient of mine. And she had pelvic congestion, but it is so widely unrecognized. Yeah. I'll tell, I'll tell you two little anecdotes of mine as well, because it really, one is one of my best friends is a gynecologist in the UK. She's absolutely brilliant. She, she's very, very good at, at what she does in the menopause area. And one day I was talking to her about this and I said, you know, it's amazing. We don't ever get any referrals from gynecologists. We, we only pick them up because patients read my book or, you know, they've sort of seen the website. And I said, and they're really upset because they've spent so long looking for an answer. And I said, you know, at, at laparoscopy, surely sometimes, I know the veins are deep inside, but I said, sometimes you must see varicosity. She said, oh yeah, they all have them. <laughs> I said, I said, I said so, 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 so all your women with pelvic pain that you don't find, you know, another cause, you see these big veins. She said, yeah, yeah, if you haven't got endometrial, you get big bulging veins. And I said, and you don't think that's a problem? She went, no, you know, you see it all the time. And they're seeing the problem, but because nobody's educated them that that's pelvic congestion, they just say normal just a bit veiny the second one i must say about is for many years when i used when i was sort of standing up at um, conferences and going in the newspapers in the uk and saying look you know we can now cure leg ulcers we can uh, you know pelvic veins and i was trying to bring people up into the 21st century about veins and one of my big detractors over here there's a very famous doctor into veins and he was absolutely all the time you know whenever the because newspapers always try to have the other side and they would have some they'd go to him and he was often the person who'd say oh uh, you know it's not right it's not true and he was really horrible and at meetings it'd be absolutely very very horrible to our research and then out of the blue i got a phone call from him and said my daughter has just got uh, got married and she's um having so much discomfort in her pelvis during during and after sexual intercourse deep inside and she's been to see the gynecologist two different ones very well respected her that he'd managed to being in the medical profession who got him very good um uh, referrals they'd said there's nothing wrong with her and she'd ended up under a psychiatrist and he said, he, and his words were, he said, I don't believe anything that you say, but would you mind scanning her? <laughs> so so, so, so we, we sent her to Judy Holdstock, who is expert, who did the, who's designed the, you know, the transvaginal duplex and the criteria that we do um, with uh, Charmin Harrison. And she found that all four veins, both ovarian and both internal ileic, absolute hosing, huge, no, no compressions, no nutcracker, nothing else. Nice, easy one to do. We coiled, embolized it all completely and utterly. You know, they had the usual bit of post-operative discomfort because you've thrombosed them. A couple of a couple of months later, absolutely pain-free. Seven months later, pregnant and with no trouble at all. And you know, he's never even. I've met her at meetings since. He never even acknowledges me. Never thanks. Never even comes up and says, "Actually, you know, you're still speaks out against pelvic congestion." unbelievable isn't it? it it's unbelievable i i uh it's it's so sad so i mean it i so it bothered me so much i told you my previous employer um i was over from 2006 to 2010 i was finding all these indications for patients with pelvic and and iliac vein disease and uh and he just didn't understand it he thought i was taking he thought i was taking ablations away from him yeah. Instead, I was like, no, I'm finding the root cause. And I would have so many women who would cry. They would start mm -hmm. crying and they would, and it's, it's almost magical. Cause I would ask, you know, I would see something on the ultrasound that would indicate pelvic involvement. And I swear they would think I was like a, a astrologist because I could sit yeah. there and go, you know, you have, you have low back pain, you have pain during intercourse mm -hmm. and, and they would start crying because they had been to doctor after doctor after doctor. Yeah. Um, it's very, I will say it's very rewarding. Um, and I think with vein disease and I, I, maybe I hope you have the same result. I think it's more life-changing than any other vascular, you know, you can, 
it's crazy. You can find a critical carotid on somebody, you can treat it and the patient lives a little bit and they, they're not going to bring you a basket of fruit. I, when we find somebody's problem that they've searched for 15 years and been taking antipsychotics and you relieve that pain. Oh my God. They end up being like a, a disciple and telling yeah. the whole world about yeah. you. And it, it's amazing. Very rewarding. And- and you get exactly the same thing with Venus leg ulcers who have been told for years that you have to have manuka honey or compression and stuff. And one day they'll suddenly find out that actually you can treat the underlying cause, the veins. And 18 weeks later, on average, they dis- the ulcer disappears and they do they, they have to wear compression majority of the time. And it is, it's life changing. We've even had a couple of patients start to sue um, the NHS because they were never told. And of course, over here, we've got to think of the NICE guidelines, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence guidelines. And even even though those guidelines, which everyone's meant to follow, say if you have a venous leg ulcer or severe varicose veins, you should have a duplex scan and treatment. They were written by English doctors on English, on Eng, or I said should say UK doctors, by uh, or, you know randomised control studies paid for by the UK tax office, and still those same doctors have once they've got their names on the papers, go back to not treating them. It is utterly ridiculous that you know you you have a country that pays for the research and all other research a very clever fellow john michaels up from um who's now a health uh, he's a doctor but he also does a lot of health eco- economics up in sheffield and he showed many years ago there's a st- study called the reactive study and just even if you talk about leg varicose veins even away from pelvic varicose veins but just leg varicose veins per pound spent you actually get more improvement for longer so what's called a quality of life year for each pound you spend than you do for almost any other disease than cancers arterial surgery or anything because you not only relieve the problem now but you prevent the problems in the future and you're doing it on patients who have got decades to live who aren't at the other end of life and venous disease should be right up there it should be the thing people are talking about but it's just not sexy people don't <laughs> Yeah, you don't talk about it no and and it's so so this is the most frustrating for me is, and the public doesn't understand this. Your doctor doesn't know anything about vein disease. It, and chances are your vascular surgeon, and, and I know this is very controversial to say, but they don't know shit either. And I'll give you an example, Mark. I, I told somebody the other day, I, I find it crazy. There's like this group of vascular surgeons. They have 19 vascular surgeons in their group and they're marketing varicose veins to the public. Okay. And they're spending money marketing varicose veins. And I, I sat down and I was talking to a friend and I said, listen, varicose venous disease is 15 times more prevalent than arterial disease. So think about this. You have 19 surgeons, vascular surgeons, almost all of their patients are Medicare, 65 years old or older, probably 80% of them. And they're doing all this arterial work and they have all this venous work walking through their own clinic. And yet they're advertising for a 32 year old girl with spider veins and the patient with venus uh stage four venous disease yeah. all is walking through their clinic and they don't even recognize it it's yeah. crazy to me it is we, we have a problem i mean as an academic as um a chairman of a session in a, 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 a paris meeting um in about just before covid about end of 2018 and it just struck me i was on the table uh, on the sort of thing and there were a couple of american colleagues there as well but mainly it was a european meeting and somebody from the audience just started the conversation they said why is it that venous disease is so abysmally looked after and lo- looked at And I said, I can't speak for any other one, but in England, what happens is we have the National Health Service, which has a monopoly on on jobs and training. And people who do private practice have trained in the NHS and then do some private work. And our difficulty is, is if the NHS doesn't recognize a condition and doesn't train people for it, it doesn't occur. So we don't have consultant vein surgeons. And unfortunately, the public and everyone else thinks vascular means veins they don't realize it means arteries and we should call vascular should be renamed arterial and venous should be venous and that way people would understand that we don't have any venous consultants in the uk in the nhs and because of that there is no training because nobody trains if there isn't a job there and of course the medical scores don't train if there's not a job either so 
I had a patient the other day who came to see me, in fact, two years ago now, and she was a, a research fellow of mine. And I do these um, research fellowships for people who want to be medical students. And I give them a summer and I get them to write, publish some papers and it helps them in their career. And she had come and done this, got a place at medical school, gone through her medical schools up in Manchester. And um, she came back as a junior doctor for me to do her veins. And I said, well, it's very kind of you, but, you know, it's a few hundred miles. Why didn't you, which for England's a long way. <laughs> and I said, I said, you know, why didn't you have it done in Manchester? She said, well, number one, if you saw what they were doing there, you wouldn't have it done. She said, but number two, she said, in my five years of training, she said, I had one hour training on varicose veins. And when I went to that lecture, I went in there and this was the down is the veins and varicose veins lecture one hour in five years. And she said the, the consultant didn't turn up and sent their registrar instead because they weren't going to waste their time teaching varicose veins. The registrar turned up and said, and it's only a couple of years ago, said, I don't really know much about veins. The boss told me to come along, but you know, if they're bulge, then you should strip them out. You know, do you have any questions? And that she knew different because she'd worked in my unit, but do you know all those other people, they're going to be the GPs and the family doctors of five years time. And that's another generation of doctors who are going to go through still thinking venous diseases, a bit cosmetic -y, a bit of peripheral, you know, and it is a huge uphill battle to explain that 30% of the population have a problem that deteriorates and you leave it long enough and it becomes a medical problem. And that's before you get to the pelvic congestion and everything else. That's just your, you know, that's just your leg veins. <laughs> yep. No, I agree. I mean, so in the United States, uh, a lot of the large uh, hospital institutions, they won't allow you because of the drug reps in the past, they won't let you do lunch and learns anymore. Uh, and so it's very hard to educate somebody. And what we found, uh, my experience is if somebody comes in for leg pain, uh, the doctor will send them to orthopedics first, the orthopedics, they'll clear them, they come back and then they'll send them to pain management. So I think Harvard and Stanford and Stanford both did a study and they found one in four people with radiculopathy, nerve pain or pain in the legs had undiagnosed chronic venous insufficiency. Wow. And, wow, and that's so, interesting. So, yeah. so, but the problem is, it's how do you reach those people? In, mm. in our clinic, you have to reach them like you do through social media. Yeah. And that, that's what's crazy is we finally, it takes probably about 10 patients who come back to their doctor and go, why, why didn't you tell us about this before? Now I have one great referral group out of Tyrone, Georgia, and I actually have a nurse practitioner there. Um, I can't think of her name, but she is amazing. She actually sends us patients and she'll actually write the order to check for pelvic congestion. She, she understands it so well. And this is just somebody who is willing to listen take an hour or two to listen. And then as she's heard more patients, more patients, she's become one of our best referrals, but it's like speaking to the, to the, uh, to, to the deaf, as far as yeah. uh, trying to communicate to people. Yeah. And then the, of course, with pelvic venous disease, a lot of the GYN docs, they solve it by taking out the, uh, the uterus. Oh, and I when know. they take out the uterus, they take out all the, the, the engorgement engorged veins and there is some symptom relief, but then the patient develops hormonal dysfunction and gets gains weight and all these side effects that are bad. I, I've just actually commented on social media. I don't know if I'll get into trouble because in, in um, uh, last, last week, I think it is in Canada, there's a doctor who um, took out um, uh, somebody's fallopian tube for pelvic congestion. And when he was in there, took out the other one, so made her sterile. And she's turned around and sued him for making him sterile. And he's counter suing her for trying to ruin his reputation because he had consented and everything. And I wrote and said, it, it's irrelevant. If it's truly pelvic, unless the reporter's got it wrong, if it's pelvic congestion, what was he doing touching a fallopian tubes in any case? Yeah, it has nothing I mean, the, to do with it. <laughs> It's a, it's a vein problem. Don't touch the, don't touch her, her reproductive organs. You know, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. But is that what, what I would say is that and you're, you're, I can tell your frustration, but it's even worse in the UK because what we found in the US, at least most of your patients do their research. 
Yeah. And what I found is on my, um, with the books I've written, with my YouTube video, with my papers, with my website, it, it, we get so many more questions from people in the States than we do in the UK. Um, even though we're a UK based company, because the UK doctor, the patients, and we've still got this thing in the UK that if my GP says it, then they must know. And they don't question it. And they don't think, does my GP actually know the latest advances in OBGYN, ENT, neurosurgery? You know, they don't realize that it's a very generalist opinion. So we have the problems. I, I wrote something up about, uh, you probably know the, the 2012 guidelines showing that if you have thrombosis in your great venous vein or small venous vein, so what they used to call phlebitis or chronic venous uh, thrombophlebitis. So people call it phlebitis. We now know that that, you know, if the clot in the end of that gets close to the deep veins, you've got a 1% chance of a pulmonary embolism. So everyone who gets diagnosed with phlebitis must have a duplex ultrasound scan. And if it's close to the junction, should be anticoagulated. Guidelines from the USA, guidelines from the UK, 2012. So I wrote up in Facebook to everyone, you know, watch out for this. If they're told you've got phlebitis, you know, please follow these guidelines and of course what happens absolutely loads of gps writing for me this is disgusting you know these all get better with antibiotics <laughs> so, you know, it's not only not having an ultrasound scan but not having even the right treatment but because it's hot and red it must be infection antibiotics and you know that is still going on the number of people who get referred for a scan with phlebitis is i wouldn't say zero but it's close on zero even though the guidelines are now 10 years out uh, there. And then when people turn up to the ER and they've got a clot in their lungs, it's, oh, I wonder where that came from. And it's, you know, it, the venous disease, it, 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 oh, I, I could go on for hours, but it's just so, so frustrating. No, I agree. So, so I'm working on, on a couple book chapters myself. I, and I just had shoulder surgery two weeks ago. Um, I'm supposed to be wearing a harness, but I'm not because it doesn't look good. Um, and so I hired a girl off Facebook and she's been typing for me and literally my thermostat in my upstairs went out and I had an air conditioning guy. This was three days ago. He was walking up and down my attic stairs right outside my office and he was groaning and I started talking to him and he's like, oh, I had arthroscopic knee surgery three weeks ago. And I was like, do you, do, do you feel like you have a muscle cramp that won't go away? And he's like, oh yeah. And the, for the last three days. And I was like, you got to go to my office. And um, he ended up having uh, two out of two, two uh, gastrocnemius veins that were really thrombosed. dilated thrombosed. Uh, Soleal sinus was thrombosed and yeah. uh, he had been coughing and a little short of breath. And it's oh, like, wow. you know, he had went to the yeah. orthopedist and didn't see anything. Yeah. And even in the United States, I have a, uh, so I wrote a paper in 2014. I still cannot get uh, IEC to require muscular caffeine imaging of gastrocnemius veins. And you know, as well, when you're looking at uh, the gastroc perforators play a role in venous insufficiency, but there's still like this just constant fight over things that should be relatively for people that are deep into the venous world are simple. Yeah. Um, but. You, you're right. I mean, it, it is frightening. Some of the statistics that come out, there was, there was, there was a study that was done, uh, which I, even I was totally shocked, um, showing that if you, get, if you look at people who get off aeroplanes who have flown for more than seven hours, one in 12 have a small DVT. And most of those people, of course, we don't scan one in 12. And luckily, most of those people will get better. And they'll say, oh, I don't know why, but I had a bit of swelling on that flight, you know, but all of these things, you know, you sort of sit around and think you at least should know about it and, you know, have it. Because even if all you do is have a scan, check it doesn't grow and the second scan, you know, either three days or a week later, depending on your protocol, you know, it would be so much safer to actually know in the knowledge and just sort of wait for the disaster. And then everyone goes, gosh, you know, isn't it terrible? What can happen? <laughs> no, it's it's amazing. So listen, um, Mark, uh, Mark, man, you're amazing. I, I could talk to you for literally all day. I know... Uh, would you be opening open to having a, another discussion at another time uh, oh always uh, if it's about veins i can talk as long as you like okay i would love to talk to you about uh haifu because i i yeah. know that you are the world leader in that technology um it's something i want to uh, you know i wanted to use i want I, I i actually talked to the company i was like hey i'd love to be an investigator they didn't choose me of course uh because uh you know I don't have pedigree or whatever, but uh, I think it's a fascinating technology. 
Um, all right, pause real quick. Do you care if we just talk about it quick for 20 minutes? No, no I don't have to bring you. I was just doing that to segue. No, please. Please do. I'm very happy to. I actually had dinner with um, the CEO um, last night, uh, the night before last, and we've got some new things coming out. So I'm very happy to talk about okay. it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to act like, because uh, they're going to edit this, uh, yeah. and I'm just going to act like, you know, we talked yesterday, and I'm glad to have you back, and uh, and we'll do that. So, All right. Good afternoon. It's great to have, uh, we had such a great discussion yesterday, and there's there's so, a wealth of knowledge by Dr. Mark Whiteley in the Whiteley Clinic at the UK. I invited him back for a second episode because he is the lead world world leader in a new Venus technology that really isn't uh, hasn't really come to the United States yet. Uh, it, it's in trials, um, but I think it is the future of, of vein treatment. And uh, so, Dr. Mark Whiteley, can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, uh, what you're what you're doing with with high food love it thank you very much yeah, i'd love to uh, i'd love to sort of just uh, uh go through this because it is such a fantastic area but i also want to although at the moment we're doing the the uh, we're the first unit to do sort of clinical cases I've, i also have to give mention to alfred obermeyer from vienna who did a lot of the preliminary work with the company called thraclion and he's done a fantastic job of sort of you know getting them to the stage where it can be commercial and then we've taken it on now into the commercial but I think, you know, Alfred does need recognition for all of his work. Otherwise, I feel guilty. No, I, no, no. I understand. I, I And I don't know Alfred. And so I, I didn't understand that information. So thank you for clarifying. Um, I still think you're the world leader when it comes to this technology. <laughs> but uh, that's awesome that he was involved in, on the first stage. So. Lovely. Thanks. So what we did is we start, we, uh, David um, Kalmartin, who's the CEO, and uh, Michelle Newter brought it to me because Michelle and I had worked uh, 23 years ago when we brought radio frequency and endovenous surgery into the UK. And we'd done such a sort of good job of getting people to understand that. So they said, look, could we try and do the same thing with HIFU? So the basic thing with HIFU, what we know now, and when, when endovenous surgery first started, it was all about doing uh ablating veins getting rid of veins closing them permanently but through pinholes and what we had to we, the first thing about it was oh we were sticking the vein together but very quickly we came to learn that what we were actually doing was killing all the cells in the vein wall the transmural death which i wrote up in 2004 and once we understood that we realized that what we have to do is we have to get heat energy into the vein wall to shrivel it away to contract the protein and kill the cells and if you do that you have 100 success rate and that's why foam sclerotherapy doesn't work in big veins because it only damages the inner wall it works in thin veins but not thick ones so only heat will do that now this, these wonderful scientists who have been doing this work on high intensity focused ultrasound, and they started off doing um, parathyroid uh, tumors and then um, thyroid tumors, then breast tumors, things that didn't move. And then this fellow wonderful scientist, Michelle Newton, suddenly said, hang on a second, we can do veins. And of course, everybody turned around and said, no, you can't, you know, the, your veins have got blood running. And he said, no, we'll squash them. And when you squash them, they don't have veins, the blood running. It's, you know, oh my God, what a genius idea. So what it is, HIFU, it, the, it is exactly what it says. So it's ultrasound. So it goes through tissue and it's non-ionizing. It's not x-rays. It doesn't damage tissue at all. Just like when you look at babies, it's no damage at all, but it's focused. So it starts off as a uh, outside the body is a big cone that's focused down to one point. So you have one imaging system where you can see what's going on inside the body. That's your usual ultrasound and that's your, the thing you guide it with. And that's got a couple of guide ropes on it. And wherever that is touched, when you fire it, the ultrasound dome gives the vibration down that focuses that point and you get 90 degrees centigrade at that point. And that 90 degrees centigrade is enough to kill a cell to constrict it, to do exactly what laser and radio frequency do, to destroy the vein, but in only one tiny area. That's the basis of it. But as you can also imagine, each time you destroy it, you're only taking it like two millimeters, three millimeters of vein. And so the the issues we've got, and you know, it is it's an ongoing thing. We've just uh, had Mark Three machine delivered uh, yesterday, actually, um, and the company are working so well with us to improve the imaging, to improve the speed. 
when we first started doing every time we fired the machine it was eight seconds to cause that temperature and then 45 seconds to 46 seconds to cool down now if you're going to do a long vein you know bring a packed lunch it's, it's a long time yeah. but as you said it's, it's a bit like you know the Model T Ford being, you know, everyone turned around and said, well, it won't work because it's not fast enough. And now we've got Lamborghinis and Ferraris and Dodges and, you know, you've got these fantastic cars. So the same thing is going to happen with this and it's rapidly improving. We now have a 0 0.5 second pulse with a six second cooling. That's really revolutionized things. And the great thing about the, and where the, where this is going to go is it is looking and seeing the vein you want putting a bit of pressure on it to squeeze it and as an automated thing, firing and seeing the changes, maybe firing a second time, and then the robot arm coming down the vein and repeating that. So the what is going to happen in the long term, and these are now my projections. So at, the, at this moment, we're showing how much we can do and we're speeding it up and do you need an aesthetic, you know, local aesthetic or just a bit of painkiller, never general or anything like that. There's no, nothing goes inside the vein. There's no risk of infection, nothing gonna break off. It's all external. And the only needle might be, some people need a bit of local anesthetic if it's painful, but many people just take some, you know, a small painkiller and that's it. The future though, in the short term, is not only gonna be faster and better, but the machine is going to learn to identify the vein. So my feeling is, Within a year or two, and we're already working towards this in my clinic, this is not going to be doctors doing it. This is going to be the RVTs and vascular scientists and vascular technologists doing it. Oh, man. Why have so, it hold on, hold on, hold on. You, <laughs> you just, you just, so that was going to be my biggest question. Like, when I first thought about this, I was like, you know, because I'm going to be honest with you, okay? Um, in the United States, um, I an RVT has to have over 2000 hours of imaging to be able to get their credential, but a physician can go get a credential with zero experience. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and a nurse practitioner, same thing. Yeah. Nurse practitioner can go get a credential with zero experience. Yeah. I, they're teaching, they're teaching physicians how to do focused ultrasound and they don't even know what the hell they're looking at yeah. um and yeah. and and it's really so i always find it in america so i teach physicians how to access veins all the time yeah but legally i cannot access a vein by myself yeah it's a right, ridiculous this gray area and i'm like i'm like which is harder to teach somebody how to how to how to use a needle or how to use the ultrasound but in america yeah. it's no you can't use the needle even though you have yeah. the experience of the ultrasound and you know exactly where you're wanting to go you have to give yeah. it to somebody else who who has the license to put the needle in and that doesn't know where it needs to go it, it doesn't I, I, th I think if you if you talk to the vascular technologists in england actually you'd also realize that the the outside of our clinic so away from our clinic um, there's not much respect for vascular technologists. They're regarded as just the same as radio officers and nurses. You know, it's all over there. And we're the doctors sort of thing. And this is terrible arrogance. Um, but we, we've got this uh, in our clinic. We, we, we work very much as a team. And I think I don't do the pelvic vein embolization, for instance, when we do the, um, uh, uh, the uh, pelvic congestion. I do all the research because I'm good at that. But I've got an IR, an interventional radiologist, who is superb at putting coils. Why would I do something I'm not very good at? So when we come to HIFU, which is an image-based thing, now I'm the doctor and I'm quite happy to say, right, it's the GSV or it's the periphery. I'm quite happy to make the decision as to which vein I want treated because I take, I take the role, you know, that's my, that's my insurance if I get it wrong. Sure. Yeah. But, but, but when I'm trying to find out, when I'm trying to find out in that mass of gray blobs on the screen, you know, which is the vein and which is the vein I want, I'm going to be looking over my shoulder and saying to my vascular technologist, I'm going to be saying, you know, is that it? Especially when it's altered with a bit of local anesthetic and stuff. And so I think, why should I be sitting in the seat doing it? What would be much better is someone you say who's got experience of understanding the image. They should be doing it. So in any case, we uh, just to show you that we've already thought of this in 2000, I think it was 2018, hold on, hold on, Mark, maybe. Mark, hold on, hold on, Mark. Let's start that over. We had a, your, your, your 
screen. I'm like, sorry. sorry. No, 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 no. You're fine. I just didn't want to lose it. Um, no, okay. Just go back to uh, just like you uh, 30 seconds ago when you were like. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so sorry. right. So basically in, in the, in the UK, our vascular technologists basically used to look across at, at, at America and see your RVT and they, they realized that they didn't have the great structure that you had. And so we made the SVT over here because the, 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 basically there wasn't such thing as vascular technologists, but the vascular technologists came through and, you know, they're, they're sort of now more recognized, but they, you're quite right. They're not, they're not really in most units, not regarded as that much part of the team. Now, from my point of view, you should only have people doing things who are experts. So when we do pelvic congestion, it's done by interventional radiologists, not me. I talk about it, I do the research, but you do, you only have the people who are absolutely experts. And who is better at looking at an ultrasound screen than, uh, screen than someone who does it all the time? So basically when I do my HIFU, I have a vascular technologist with me. So if I'm sort of getting lost a bit, they will say, oh, that's the thing. And I, I say, well, hang on a second, why am I doing the procedure when what I should be doing is saying I want the great severe vein or the perforate, I should be to, saying what procedure to be done, that they should be using the expertise to do it right. So what we did is we actually um, made a presentation in um, a, a, a big uh, national conference. Uh, in, I can't remember if it's 2018, 2019, but um, Angie White, who's one of our top vascular technologists, she is American uh, RVT who came to the UK. She's utterly brilliant, works with Judy Holstock, and she, she's just fantastic. She presented her HIFU cases, and she presented one case that I had actually let her do legally i had actually been supervising for insurance because she's not allowed to do it yet and she did it easily and she her, she won the prize not only talking about high food but also saying and this will become a technique done by vascular technologists oh my gosh you, you, and, you seriously that's like uh <laughs> i can't say it but i'm telling you every rvt that listens to this podcast is like over the moon i, well, I don't know if american now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if America will ever get there. Like, for instance, in America, every RVT I know writes up the report. We give all the specifics. The physician just looks over it, agrees, maybe adds a couple things here. Every it's ultrasound is sonographer dependent, not reader dependent. I, yeah. Robert Daigle said that in his book. Yeah. And I swear that's one of the lines that I feel the best. It's like um, I, I would equivalent to asking a police officer what happened instead of asking the witness. What <laughs> happened. But, but that is that is what American and it's yeah. all you know why it's about reimbursement. It's about the okay. physician gets the reading fee, even though we are doing in the UK, it's different. It's this vascular scientist. No, no, it's, it's not that different, actually, because it's the, the, okay. the professional fee still goes in. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you the business plan that I think will work and why it will probably come to the States as well. Because I was talking to the CEO of HIFU, because this is the, my, my vision is going to be that in my clinic, and I only have veins in my clinic, as you know. Yeah. So I've got the consulting rooms where the doctors consult the patients. We've got the um, ultrasound room for diagnostic ultrasound. We've got the operating theatre for all the complex ones with you know, endovenous laser foams, all the different things we have to do. And we've made a room for Sonovain because of oh, the HIFU, because at the moment, only the people with certain patterns of veins are suitable for it. Okay. So for me, I could at the moment, if I want to be arrogant and, you know, the, the man, I'm either in the HIFU room or in the theatre and the clinic is only earning one lot of professional fee however if we can get the insurance for the vascular techs and let's face it they're going to do it better because they can image recognize and they're going to do it faster better better quality and check the veins close better i will still be in operating on ones that i need to be operating maybe taking you know an advisory role just popping out and looking at the high food but the high food should be going on in parallel with the diagnosis and with them so for me the business plan works well for the patients you're going to have the right person doing the procedure and that's the person who knows what the image shows and for the company who makes it 
they're going to actually be getting the best results because they're going to have people who know what they're doing. And we know that in the early days of endovenous surgery, there were a lot of people who were quoting 60% uh, improvements with um, with radio frequency, uh, so 60% ablations rather than what we were getting with 99 to 100%, because they weren't really au fait with doing it. They'd come from an artery background. They were just doing what the rep told them rather than understanding the power and the size and everything else. And it's the same thing. If you don't get people who are expert at doing something, you don't get good results. It's not the technique. It's the person doing it and the technique. And so my, my view of this is this should be led by uh, vascular technologists right from the beginning. And in my clinic, as I say, we've won the prize already. We put our hat in the ring and said, this is the way we're gonna go. What we're doing at the moment is um, we're, we've got an upgraded machine from Sonovane for legal reasons and research reasons. I'm at the moment doing the cases to make sure that the new powers are set with usually a vascular technologist coming in or one of the, um, people from Sonobine, but our business plan over the next year is to get insurance from our vascular technologists, to get the ones who want to do it and to actually get them doing it with me being supervisory. And that's that's the role we're gonna go. And I'm sure that's gonna be best for patients and it's gonna be best for costs. It's gonna be best for throughput. I mean, I, I can't see a downside to that. The only way I can see a downside is when doctors decide to do it themselves because they want to and give second best treatments, you know? No, I, I agree. So man you've got me excited i want to come i want to come to the uk and, and actually spend spend some time with you honestly um so you're welcome I, I, so i teach for phillips and uh, i teach their management and uh chronic management of venous disease uh, course and one of the things i'm an advocate of is having sonographers in um, the room during endovenous ablation and uh in america it doesn't always happen um and, and I, I do believe, you know, if somebody has extensive experience, it's probably not needed. But in my view, as four eyes are better than two, judgment wise, it helps. Um, and cost wise, it's not that significant to have, like you say, an expert in ultrasound to be in the room with with the physician who often don't have experience with ultrasound training wise. Yeah. Um, and the thing that I find the most is almost every time I talk to facilities where the physician does it by themselves. They have high complication rates with yeah. e hits. They have all these things that their sonographers are seeing. Yeah. But the other thing that I think is the physicians hiding half of the information from the sonographer when they're in the procedure with the physician, they understand the total picture and yeah. they can think like a physician and go, you know what, this is why I need to, this is important. This is needs to be noted in yeah. the report. Yeah. Um, but we, we have in the, in the Whiteley protocol, um, which is what, how I run my clinics and it's all based on research and our experience. So when we very first started um, and we did the first uh, venous closure in um, uh, 1999, March, 1999 in the UK, there have been two done in Europe before them where they'd cut into the groin, done a high tie and passed the venous closure back down so they knew where they were. And I'd said to the company, but that's the wrong way. You should be putting it up for the knee upwards. And they were saying, no, no, it's dangerous. And they didn't want to. So although we tell everyone we were the first in the UK, in fact, we were the first in Europe to do it as a percutaneous technique going upwards. And I had Judy Holdstock with me. And I said to her, you just make damn sure that I don't go across the junction and we say where the top is. And the when we started doing commercially, I mean, it worked really well. And then one day, Judy couldn't turn up. And I thought, oh, you know, I can scan. I could do the bits and pieces. So, <laughs> so I did it without her because she was caught in traffic, whatever. I was going to lose the case. And trying to control the catheter at the bottom end, with my hand at the top end, trying to get, as we used to, right up close to the junction, it slipped forwards, I didn't notice, and we got a common femoral vein stenosis that, thank goodness, settled after a week on warfarin. And that's still one of my heart-stopping moments of my life. And we have an absolute rule in my clinic that you will have a vascular technologist or vascular scientist, whatever you want to call them, doing all the imaging from the putting from the marking the patients to putting the catheters in to following it down to checking it's closed at the end whether it's perforators truncal veins whatever and they don't leave the room till the laser or radio frequency is finished and the the uh, doctor whether it's surgeon or it takes responsibility 
working in the right vein or the other bits and pieces. And we have, as you say, the four eye technique. I think the four eye principle has got to be, you all know that you've done the right operation in the right veins at the right time. The other thing is when you do the complex things like the hedgehog technique into neovascular tissue or the trollop technique into perforators, you've got to have three hands. You can't have an ultrasound, cannulate it, put the laser down, put the the, the, ultra, the thing in, unless you've dropped the probe, in which case you've lost control, and that's dangerous. So I, I in, in our clinic, in the white clinic, the protocol states, and we are, no one is ever allowed to operate without a, a vascular technologist doing the imaging at the, and a doctor doing the, the, the case. The only time it's going to change is with HIFU. <laughs> no, no. So, so in my clinic... We do everything. So I have uh, five nurse practitioners. I have three physicians, two are IR doc, or four physicians, two IR docs, um, a, a general plastic surgeon, and then actually another guy who's a, a pain management and anesthesiologist from Harvard. He's the one who, who got me onto the radiculopathy. Um, every procedure we do has an RVT. Um, if we do ultrasound guided Verathena, or microfoam sclerotherapy and RVT is yeah. driving that. And, and that is different than everywhere else. Everybody else. It's like yeah. the physicians. And I don't know if you do microfoam sclerotherapy yeah. with, with Verathena. Um, all of our people around us who don't, you know, and do don't use the RVTs. They have these high complication rates, but the doctor's just kind of like, Oh, it's asymptomatic. It's no big, no, it is a big deal. Um, and the other thing we do every quarter, we get a report card. So what we do is each, every procedure that we do, whether it's sclerotherapy, ultrasound guided sclerotherapy, uh, EVLT, or, or, or Ver uh, Medtron, I mean, a closure radio frequency, everyone, we, we track complications, whether they're minor or big. And every three months we sit down, we have a dinner, we have drinks, of course, and yeah. uh, you get a report card. So what, what we found is that this provides information between the providers, but also with the uh, RVT that's assisting. And so especially with microfoam sclerotherapy, you may have, uh, let's say, one nurse practitioner who worked with four, four RVTs, and her complication rate may be less than 2% with three of the RVTs, but 8% with one of them. And then we go back. And we say, why? Is there yeah. a technique issue? Is there a communication issue? What is the issue? And man, it has made a world of a difference in our in our vein centers. So yeah, well, we, we also were um, close. I set up this thing uh, uh, called the College of Phlebology, um, and uh, for England and Europe, we've sort of set up a, a thing of the Venus Registry five years ago. Um, and uh, the, the whole idea is we we you, have, you track patients not only yourselves but also they then feed back as well um, those who wish to because it's uh, done by an encrypted email that they get, and so we get we we've got long term follow up starting to come through as well. The the problem we have at the moment with that is purely and simply the bad doctors who know they've got high complications don't join. They don't report. And they don't report. Absolutely, and. Do you know, it's, it's, it's such important thing. And uh, uh, yet another thing, uh, as I said to a couple of things that I say to people run away from, if you don't, my view is if you're not, if, if your doctor's not part of a registry uh, or doesn't do what you're doing, have a report card system, you know, the patients shouldn't be, you should never go to a doctor who says, well, I think my results are good because my patients don't seem to come back. They, they should be able to show you figures, either audited figures or, you know, like you've got your report card figures or they should be part of a, a national, international registry. There should be some comeback on it because otherwise, you know, it's the usual thing of buy cheap, buy twice. It's just, you know, it, it, the doctors with the fancy websites look good. And let's face it, most people's veins look good six weeks to three months after treatment, no matter what you do, because you get thrombosis and bruising. The question is, are you still happy one, two and three years later? <laughs> No, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I find, um, like one of our top referrals is a vascular surgeon who's right down the road from us. And he has no idea. All he does is he treats GSVs. He doesn't treat any accessory saphenous veins. Mm -hmm. A year and a half later, all the patients have reoccurrence and they yeah. come to us and he gets mad uh, that we are being, or we're successful because he's a vascular surgeon and my doctor is not. 
<laughs> and yet we're 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 beating his pants off. The other thing that I find is funny, and I look at this a lot of times when I look at experts, I look at their reviews in America, and man, a lot of times people reviews are bad. Or mm -hmm. you'll have like the other day I looked up somebody who is an expert. And I'm not going to say their name. They're an expert. They've been around for 20 plus years. I went to their review site, and they had three Google reviews five stars now you're telling me they've been in practice for 20 years and they're a leader in the field of and they only have three reviews in in in, in a mm. decade and it, what they've done is they've canceled their google account and republished it because of bad reviews mm. um that's something i'm proud about like our practice mm. if you go truffles vein specialist if you go and look uh we've been in business almost six years our reviews mm. go back six years we've got about 153 five-star reviews and most mm. of those patients this is what I find is fascinating. Almost to a T, everyone who leaves a review is somebody who was previously treated somewhere else, who didn't yeah. get relief, who finally, they're so happy to finally get an answer that they're willing to, to publicly go on and, and, yeah. and make a review. I think it's so interesting. And I think it's so important that you see people who are interested in the job, because I think, you you know, I always say to my patients, it's quite funny how, you know, you'll have ladies who will go to one hairdresser, but not another, because they'll know that one's actually interested and one just does the job. And they'll go take their car to one garage and not another. But with doctors, they just assume they're all the same because they're professional. And it's not true. You know, there's many who are more interested in cars and getting home and everything else and just do the job. And there's those who are really interested and put the extra effort into making that team at work that give the good results no i agree uh there's so many uh mark I, I've, I've followed you for for literally uh probably 10 years or, or more since linkedin started um yeah. i've always i think we 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 have very like-minded uh thought process um and like you i i no. so i'll go back to 2008 when we start our 2007, when we started doing ultrasound guided sclerotherapy of the distal GSV. Um, oh, on LinkedIn, I was killed. Yes. I was killed. I was told, no, you're supposed to do phlebectomy. You know, yeah. no, and that's cosmetic. You're, you're, you're not, you, you, that's not, that doesn't. And I'm telling you it, it, now it's the standard of care, yeah. but at that yeah. time it was so yeah. foregone. And I did that based on, I had my own, uh, end of venous ablation in 2007 yeah. and yeah. and what i did is i i I'll, i checked after the after i did the ablation i still had reflux from the proximal calf to the to the ankle and i'm like well you know it's so stupid now i'm like you know why most patients have um the evidence of diseases in the bottom third of the leg and yet a lot of physicians so they they do the end of venous ablation procedure but they don't treat veins and yeah. uh, and I think what I love about you is you treat vein disease, not mm. perform a procedure. And I think that's a, there's a big difference. Yeah, I thank you for that, because it's been a big thing. And well, the way I put it and is a very, it's, it's, it's different words, but it's the same idea. And what I tell my doctors who come on our courses, and I say to them, look, number one, we treat the reflux and that's hemodynamics. But number two, you then treat the biology. And if you don't understand the difference between the two then there's a problem because anybody can stop the reflux but it doesn't stop the stasis the inflammation the neovascular tissue so you've got to understand the biology as well so everyone's very good at drawing the patterns and in my books you know i draw the things and say yes and we stop this and it goes this way and so that's what we all like the one-way system but you then got to think what happens after six weeks six months a year two years and that's you the biology and foam sclerotherapy has been the revolutionary thing so going back to the original thing i think hypho you know is going to be a really big challenge for the anti-reflux but we're never going to get rid of that need for the foam as well so it's not going to be a it's going to be a huge game changer but it's not going to be like none of these techniques is not going to be in isolation you're still going to need the experts who do the proper scans who are the eyes of the, the doctor who then give you the background and anyone I think nowadays who is treating somebody with one modality in one session is not going to be getting a good long-term result for most of their patients. You might get away with it once or twice, but most people need at least either two modalities in 
transport or more and certainly in our clinic our, our protocol is you come in and have your reflux done and then you go away for eight weeks and then you come back and we look at what's happened and then we and it's usually foam the second time but you know you're treating the biology then you're treating what's going on and the more you look at the way the body works and pathophysiology is it's the only way to do it. And this whole idea, I think, I think we all got into the idea of surgery where you go and once have an operation and that's it. And it's wrong for babies. It's just wrong. No, I agree. I think a lot of people, I think we average probably 13 visits for mm -hmm. a typical vein patient because you're doing follow-ups, you're seeing what's yeah. closed, you're making sure everything's good. Um, I agree. I, I do believe that most people who are treating veins a, it's so interesting and it goes so deep as far as the knowledge base that if you're really passionate about veins, you, it's hard to be passionate about other things. Like <laughs> most vascular surgeons, at least in the United States, they, they probably denote five to 10% of their practice to veins. And I would tell somebody just, just like you, if somebody only spends five to 10%, why would you trust them? as an expert for your vein treatment. You want somebody who is living, breathing this all day long. And everybody like in my clinic, we have 35 employees. And I always say our, our, our last of our end of our name is vein specialist with an S. And I said, because every single person on my staff, whether it's the person answering the phone, the person doing the pre-cert, their focus is veins, their expertise is veins. And that, that should be what you look for. Uh, and I think if you're in the UK or even if you're in the United States, I mean, I get people who fly out of state to see me. Hey, I go see Mark Whiteley in, in the UK, especially if you have a high deductible, you know, uh, our insurance different are so different between uh, what you guys have and what we do. Um, but uh, I, I, I think you've done an amazing job of uh, educating the world about uh, vein disease. I think the work that you've done is uh, beyond uh, admirable. It will live on long after we're both gone. Um, Thank you. But I, I do appreciate you being on the show, uh, the Hey Move Fair podcast. And, and seriously, Mark, I would love to, uh, you know, come out and, and see your state-of-the-art facility. And, and listen, if you're in the, in the America... I would love to have you uh, down to ours and uh, and uh, have a meal and a little Southern hospitality for you. That's fantastic. Thanks very much. I'll take you up on that, especially now that COVID seems to be uh, getting less of a problem. So uh, I'll try and do that in the next year. No. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Have a, have a wonderful Saturday. And thank Lovely. you for being on the Hey Move Fair podcast. Thanks very much, Brian. Lovely speaking to you. All right. Bye-bye. So you, you disappeared. Oh, I did. What happened?